So it's the land of the free and the home of the brave. But how come so many people in America are living paycheck to paycheck? So I'll explain in this episode the number one reason why most Americans don't ever become millionaires starting in three, two, one. Let's go. Never short stopping. Now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor. Yeah, I'm getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches. Now I'm making seven figures like. What's cracking, everybody? Money smart guy, Matt Zapala here. Hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. And if you didn't hear, our next goal is to reach 150,000 subs. Why? Because we want to award a church, charity, or nonprofit $5,000 from this YouTube community called The Seven Figure Squad. So if you haven't done so already, please hit subscribe. All right, so after a recent conversation, after one of our weekly workshops here in Dallas, we're having some cigars outside at Ray Crockett's restaurant here called Chop Shop, and uh, some of the guys were asking, what's the difference between this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy? How come this person isn't making it? How come this person's making it? And we started having a conversation about why certain people had certain degrees, people had certain levels of experience, people had certain uh, levels of skills that a lot of people didn't have. So why are certain people not making it in business? Why are certain people living paycheck to paycheck? Why aren't people living happy, at least financial lives, a financial life that at least they studied for and they hoped for and they planned for and they worked for, how come they're not making it? So there's a little study here I wanna go over here and uh, just wanna share some of this data with you. There's a difference between rich and poor in America, obviously, and there's things called income inequality and a wealth gap, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not as, I'd say, logical as you think. Let's take a look at Spectrum Group, this report, they say uh, 13.6 million millionaire households. If you take out the home equity in their primary residence, there's 13.6 million millionaire households in the United States in 2020. And mind you, this is in the middle of a pandemic. See that stat? 13.6 million millionaire households minus the primary residence or any equity that may have increased through the last year, year and a half in the U.S. in 2020 in the midst of a pandemic. The other data point here is Ameriprise Financial states that only 13% of millionaires consider themselves wealthy. What? Only 13% of millionaires consider themselves wealthy wealthy and more than a quarter of Americans have no retirement savings, zero. Who are they going to be depending on? 35% of Americans say a $400 emergency would be very, very hard to cover. You know, the irony in these data points, I was reading and I was studying it. This was me one day. At one point in my 47 years of being on this earth, three of these data points was me. Let's take a look at this next slide. I'm coming from Chicago. Born and raised in Chicago. The only time I spent out in Chicago was the eight years I served in the United States Marines. And uh, this was a report in the Chicago Tribune that in the city of Chicago, nearly half of all the Chicago residents can't afford to live where they live. And that is a sad reality. And so when you look at these type of things, why are people then stuck in this financial position? Is it because inflation, wages, all these different things? Is, is it really that logical? Is it really that simple? So. Here's a couple thoughts. What are some of your expectations that you've had in your life? What are some of the things that people expected you to do? For example, I missed out on my 30 year high school reunion. Okay, it was this past Saturday, I was held back up in Chicago, couldn't make it. But to my high school buddies, they uh, had a high school reunion back there, 30 year high school, so happy post 30 year high school reunion there, uh, class of 1991, Morton West High School in the, the Burrow and Cicero Stickney area. And, um, what are some of the expectations? Well, here's my expectation when I was leaving high school. I had the uh, funniest sense of humor. I had the most obnoxious laugh, but I wasn't expected to win. I wasn't expected to do anything in my life. Matter of fact, there's a whole lot more talented and skilled and popular people in my high school than me. And uh, we're looking for everybody to celebrate their success one day, and that day for them never happened. And then silently, people like myself wanted to win. Silently, people like myself had greater expectations of ourselves than many people externally outside of our current lives had for us. No problem. We had uh, no expectations from the military. I had no expectations from my coach. I had no expectations from uh, the people I surrounded myself with at that time. Because why? Because my expectations for me or the illusion that I had is that I really wasn't going to be much of anything. I was too tall, too skinny, not Filipino enough, broke you know, making the wrong decisions. So there wasn't very many expectations of this guy with a 2.2 GPA in high school and just did enough, 
just to skate by. And furthermore, I was accountable to nobody. Sure, I uh, played sports. Sure, I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, I found myself excelling in the Marine Corps because I found a new version of me in the Marine Corps. But at the same time, too, as well, even in the Marine Corps, my service in the Marine Corps, there was a lot of expectations about myself. Um, but thank goodness there was accountability uh, for me in the military. So I'm looking at the story here of um, some of our guys uh, that are championing the National Football League, okay? And uh, football season just got started. You know, I'm a diehard Chicago Bears fan. But nevertheless, I want to redirect back to this point here that there's more than 17 undrafted free agents in the Hall of Fame. Let me repeat that one more time. 17 undrafted free agents in the Hall of Fame. I took this data from 2019 from NFL.com. Compared to 13 former number one overall picks and eight Heisman Trophy winners. So what, what was the difference? There was a lot of expectations on the first round draft picks. So a lot of expectations on the, the Heisman Trophy winners. So there's a lot of pressure, possibly unnecessary pressure on these guys because they're picked number one overall. They're the number one player in college. They got the whole Heisman Trophy winner. You're expected to win because you're better than everybody. You're expected to win. There's an advantage for those of you that's watching this right now. And nobody expected much of you. Your family never expected much of you. Your college never expected much of you. Your high school friends never expected much of you. Your coach never expected much of you. Your boss never expected much of you. Your children don't expect of you. Your wife don't expect much of you. But deep down inside, the question for you is, do you expect a lot of you? So one of the things that I discuss all the time through our financial workshops is what do you expect of yourself? What do you want your outcome if you want to become an entrepreneur? What is your outcome if you want to save and invest? What is your outcome? Deep down inside, I know you watching this, possibly you want to be financially free. You want to be financially independent. You uh, want to be a millionaire watching the Seven Fear Squad YouTube channel. And just like these 17 undrafted free agents that have entered the Hall of Fame, superseding and exceeding the expectations of the former number one overall picks as well as Heisman Trophy winners, they made it happen. They succeeded well and above the expectations that were set for them. Perhaps that there was an advantage. And perhaps the same advantage exists for you. You know, Tom Brady drafted in a sixth round. He's still fired up about the scouting report that was given to him uh, 21 years later after this interview here. And uh, uh, Tom Brady, as many of you know, uh, still playing well into his 40s. I think he's 42, 43 years old, still playing in the NFL. Um, who is playing after 40 years old in the NFL? Tom Brady is. Uh, not very many people are doing that. But 21 years and seven Super Bowl, Super Bowl rings later, he still remembers the scouting report. In the scouting report, this is what they said about him. Tom Brady, poor build, skinny, lacks great physical stature and strength and gets knocked down easy. And then Tom Brady says, wow, that kind of fires me up. And he goes on to say in this interview, when people tell you, hey, you can't do this, you can't do this, and you keep overcoming that, you build this confidence in yourself and this belief in yourself that even when nobody else believes in you, I'm still going to do it. Because I don't give a crap about what you say, Brady said in a 2002 video. How many of you guys feel that way about when somebody says, you can't do it? Now, with that being said, I also want to say tongue-in-cheek, there's a lot of people in your life that will challenge you too as well. There's a lot of people in your life that, uh, if you allow them, will put you to a level of standard that they feel that you can be performing at. Now, a lot of people didn't expect that out of Tom Brady. They said, ah, skinny, kick gets knocked down a lot, not a lot of accountability here. But some of you have people in your life that have held you accountable, and you don't like it. You don't like being not necessarily told what to do, but reminded about how talented and gifted and purposed your life can be if you just express that talent, if you put it to use. But some of you guys and gals don't like that. Well, let's continue on here. A little bit about my story. I entered the United States Marine Corps in 1999 and found myself as a single father. You know, literally, um, uh, I, I want to make sure you guys know that I am Filipino. This is my Filipino mom. Of course, she's a standard five foot one height of many Filipino women. And uh, yes, she is a nurse. So I want you to know that uh, this is my real mom. Even though I may be six foot three, my mother's here. But, uh, she was meeting here in Marine Corps Air Station. I told her she went to go visit me one time. And um, she just came back from a couple of deployments at this point. And I found myself as a single father, divorced, now having to raise my own family by myself. And uh, fast forward, I entered the insurance industry. And it took me a few years to get my feet up under the ground. I took three side jobs just to get my bills, my initial bills paid. I worked at a Jiffy Lube 
uh, as a as a Jiffy Lube hood technician. I worked at uh, YMCA from five to eight o'clock in the morning just so I can read books. I worked at the Olive Garden uh, just to have an opportunity to make some cash tips and without realizing that I'm learning how to deal with human nature. Jiffy Lube, they taught me presentations and how to sell. In YMCA, uh, taught me how to make sure I read books in a short time frame of three hours, so therefore I get up and out so I can pick up my kids, drop them off at school, and I can go on to these three jobs. But it's interesting that I remember this picture. A, a person gave me my first polo shirt from a life insurance company called National Traveler's Life out in, out in Iowa. And uh, I was just so giddy about it because this is my first company. It was the first company I started with a, uh, an acquaintance of, in the Filipino community and we're gonna uh, take over the world and uh, make a long story short, after a year, year and a half of my, um, uh, my, my time running that business with this, with this gentleman, it didn't work out. I had to go off on my own and I was at a different gear in my life. I was uber aggressive about what I wanted to do because I had high expectations for myself and I didn't realize that my partner didn't have a lot of expectations for himself outside of running a glorified book club for personal and self-development. I wanted more than that. I wanted to see my agents not only uh, personally develop, but I wanted to see my agents win successfully and pay their bills and make six-figure income, seven-figure type incomes. And um, I wanted them to win. I, would, I wanted to make sure that everybody around me, my expectation about me was not only would I make money, but everybody around me too would make money. But see, nobody was giving me that expectation. Nobody was giving me a shot. Nobody was thinking anything of me. I was the underdog. I was underestimated. And uh, I remember uh, uh, waking up early in the morning, uh, going to sleep late, late at night, and having about three, four hours of sleep just so I can study, read, improve. Uh, these kids will go to sleep and um, I, I kiss them goodnight and tuck them away and they'd uh, do their thing in, in the middle of the night and get up and walk around and <laughs> I had to do all that as a single dad. So even though I had eight, three, four, five hours of sleep, it was always disrupted. It was always chopped up in two hour sections here and there. Anyway, I would get up before they got up uh, to get ready for the morning. And I decided at the age of 30 years old, I decided to give my life to Christ. Uh, nobody had a lot of expectations for me. I realized that, man, God has a lot of expectations for me. And so my life started to turn around. I started to not just do things my way, I started to do things his way. Now I'm not trying to push Jesus down your throat, I'm just telling you what my experience was. I try and push any religion towards your way, I'm just sharing with you what my experience was. Because I aligned myself with values and principles. I thought just being a good person was just good enough. And when I started having to do those weird, odd, awkward weekends where you know the kids were with me during the week and they're with their mom over the weekend and vice versa and we'll flip it around, I did the most I could with the time that I had uh, with my kids, went up at the office and, and, and um, spent time with my family, purchased my first pieces of real estate, started rehabbing homes with some of the money I earned from selling life insurance and just did what dads do. I was a girl dad, I was a boy dad, I was, I was just doing my things with my twins and just doing my thing with my son. 14 years, 14 years I was a single father. Raised my kids all the way, all the way until their uh, junior high, high school and until they did their thing, until they're grown adults and I told them uh, they had a couple options. My expectations for them at 18 years old is look, you're gonna join the military, number two, I'm gonna help you put some of your college, and I'm gonna pay all of it because I believe that there's a benefit of having some skin in the game. You have to earn your college, you have to earn your college just because your father can afford to pay you through college. Uh, doesn't mean that I'm going to, even though I could, doesn't mean I should, because I want you to have some skin in the game. And, and I had a lot of conversations with them too as well about not to go to college because of things that they were facing, you know, st you know student loan debt, you know, this politics in, 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 in college today, all, all to get a, what, an a English degree, a communication degree? Listen, they weren't gonna be a doctor, they weren't gonna be dentists, they weren't gonna be engineers, they weren't gonna be attorneys, right? They weren't gonna go into some area of specialization that wasn't their desire. They just said, Papi, we just wanna to go to college to have the potential to make more money. I said, forget that, we can show you how to go into business for yourself or find a trade that you can get yourself into without having to go $100,000 in student loan debt, which is what they're doing. And uh, all their friends are now starting to graduate and they're all saddled in student loan debt. I said, I told you, see, didn't we make the right decision because we talked about it, the expectations, the, the managing those things uh, all up front. And so when I look at these pictures, when I look at your situation, ask yourself these questions. What are some of the expectations that you have for yourself? The reason why people don't make themselves a million dollars is because they don't expect to make a million dollars. They say, oh man, they check out right away. How many times I show somebody the opportunity to make some money and I show them what my bank account looks like. I show them what my investments look like. They're like, yeah, lucky for you. Lucky for me? Lucky for me? There's no lucky for me. I expect it at myself. And then at the same time too, I put myself in a position to make sure I can take advantage of those opportunities and make sure those things would happen. So what are your expectations of yourself? Second one is what expectations that others have of you? 
Your husband, your wife, your husband has expectations of you. Your wife has expectations of you. Your husband has expectations of you. Your parents have expectations of you. Your children has expectations of you. Your community has expectations of you. Your country has expectations of you. Would you like to feel those expectations? Would you like to fulfill some of those things that people look up to you? Because if you're here saying, I want my children to do the best. I want my children to win in life. I want my children to win and do this and go on to be productive citizens. Awesome. Well, what about you? What are the expectations about you winning? Instead of you telling them what to do, you show them what to do because you're winning at your level and whatever it is that you're involved in. Are you showing them a level of expectation? Because here's what I do know. Children learn more about not necessarily what they hear, but more importantly, what they see and what they experience. Some areas of financial practicality here is, are you maximizing your income? Are you really? Or are you just saying, ah, you know, I'm good. I'm good. I got a good job. See, the biggest enemy to great, if you want to make great money, the biggest enemy to great is good. The other aspect here is, are you increasing your natural desire and inclination to save and invest? Every time I get a paycheck coming, I cannot wait to shove that into an investment account to buy baseball cards, buy gold and silver, some of the things I like personally for myself. Not to say that it's uh, advice for you. There's some things I like to enjoy myself. I like to see the appreciation and value. I like to see these sports players do well on Sundays, and I, I'm saying, yeah, I got the card. I got the card before they became a great player. I could flip, potentially flip a card for a higher profit than what I initially bought it at. These are some of the things I have a natural desire and inclination to do. You don't see me around with the gold chains, even though I have a few gold chains, I'm not rocking them all the time. And the $25,000 gold watch that the company gave me because I hit a certain milestone in the company that nobody ever accomplished until we got there. I'm, listen, the last time I got a watch was when the company gave me one. I got a company watch. I'm not going out there even though I could every month, every other month buying a new watch or buying a new car. Just, just not me because I have a higher inclination to save and invest. What about you? Are you embracing risk? One thing that most millionaires know how to do, because there is a certain level of thought process behind it, as well as acquiring skills and uh, information, is actually taking action. And that action sometimes involves risk. But are you embracing risk? What is your expectations when it comes to risk? Are you shy? Listen, there's always some level of risk. Matter of fact, the root definition of entrepreneur is to take risk. That's what entrepreneurs do. That's what millionaires do. They take risk. They take risk more than everybody else around them. Next question, are you patient to have your money compound over an extended period of time? Here's a problem. You see investments growing, you see your business growing, and you, you, you uh, see your stocks growing, and either you take your foot off the gas, and you lose momentum, or you sell out your investment too soon. You're, you, you cash out too soon, and had it been left in there, it could have grown and compounded some more, compounded some more, and compounded some more, but you were too impatient. Ask yourself, am I patient enough to allow my money to grow? Am I patient enough to allow this new endeavor, this business opportunity, to allow it to grow and manifest and compound? And am I willing to let these marketing campaigns come in? Am I willing to let my salespeople grow and take their shots and learn from the mistakes? Am I having lack of patience with them? Because one thing you have to know in business is it pertains to the money game. You have to have patience over an extended period of time. Listen, the only thing that I've observed that's instant is instant coffee. The only thing that I've observed that comes up in two, three minutes is popcorn. Not your money, not your success. So are you patient enough to allow your money, your involvement into an opportunity to finally start manifesting itself? One of the things that I share with a lot of guys that enter the insurance industry, Give yourself two years. Now, those two years don't just say, oh, okay, Matt just said two years, and kick back, relax, and just let two years go. I should be successful, right? No. Did you study? Did you increase your skills? Did you prospect? Did you follow up? Did you follow through? Did you take care of clientele? Did you ask for referrals? Did you build people? Did you duplicate yourself in other people? Did you create systems and processes? Did you follow systems and processes? Did you have a campaign, next innovative campaign? Did you hire competent staff? Are you hiring more competent staff? Are you reinvesting back into yourself or are you too soon living off the fruits of your labor? Some of the things that you need to ask yourself over an extended period of time. Last question here. Are you minimizing unnecessary risks, costs, fees, and income taxes? Are you on top of your money game? Oftentimes people get so upset that rich people aren't paying taxes. Well, legally and ethically, there's a way to either eliminate or not pay any taxes at all. Why? 
because entrepreneurs and millionaires, guess what they do? They embrace risk and take risk. Guess what the potential is to lose everything they put into it? It's on their shoulders. They put up all the money. They got all the risk. What do you have? You lose a job? Okay, you lose a job, you get another job. But they're talking about losing their home equity, their life savings, their 401k, their stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, every bit of money they'd scraped up together. In my case, I was about to lose 500 bucks because that's all I could scrape up to start my own business, which is $500. That's what I had out there at risk. And the time, obviously, I put into learning a skill or craft or a business. But guess what? When most millionaires and most people who are financially free, financially independent, when they stick with a decision and allow it to grow and manifest, and allow it to compound and duplicate, guess what happens? They start living the fruits of the labor later. Later. There's this thing called delayed gratification. I did a TV episode earlier this week why Walmart switching over just simply allowing an average person to do a layaway plan, the switching over to this affirm pay as you go plan, buy now pay later plan, guess who that's benefiting? It's benefiting the banks and Walmart. It's not benefiting the citizen. But see, that's my expectations of myself. I want to, I want to make sure I maximize my financial resources. I want to make sure my money doesn't go to maximize somebody else's. So what are you maximizing? So as I wrap up this video, there's one word, there's one phrase I want you to use. There's one affirmation I want you to use. You're looking at this video and say, you know what? I can learn real estate. I can learn insurance. I can learn stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. I can learn entrepreneurship. Yes, I know you can learn all that annual in the United States of America. If you stick with it long enough, you learn, you grow, you improvise, adapt, you overcome, guess what eventually is going to start happening to you? I can't guarantee it, but guess what eventually starts happening to you? You eventually will become a millionaire. When, why do I say that? Because most people quit. Most people say, oh, I'm supposed to be the first round draft pick, but you know, they get hit in the mouth, they can't meet some of the expectations, that high expectation that people have them now, they can't stand the pressure, they quit and move on and do something else. The benefit for you that you've been overlooked and underserved and somewhat neglected, here's the benefit for you. Nobody's expecting much of you. Don't be expecting much of, uh, of your, your, your job to business or your, or your, your investment of three, four, five hundred bucks into a new venture or investment of three, four, five thousand dollars into a new venture. Nobody's expecting much of you. Matter of fact, people are expecting you to fail. <laughs> They're not expecting you to win. But here's what you can do. One phrase, I think, will change your life. Regardless of all the situations and distractions and setbacks around you, it's this one phrase right here. I'm responsible. I am responsible. If you watch this episode up to this point right now into the totality of the episode, put in the comment section this affirmation, I am responsible. Nobody owes you nothing. Thank God for those of you watching this in the United States of America, thank God you have a country, at least up until this point, that has free enterprise, capitalism, and entrepreneurship. It's free to buy, free to sell, free to win, and free to fail. But it's that free to fail part that a lot of people want to avoid. I'm sorry, my friends. In the world of reality, there is, as much as you want an opportunity to win, there's also an opportunity to fail. And you need to embrace, if there's any expectation to say, I want to embrace failure. I am going to be responsible regardless of success or failure comes my way. Because if it's going to be, it's up to me. It's up to you. And if you want to become a first generation cash flow millionaire, nobody not only owes you anything, because they don't, but it's also 100% up to you. And that's the coolest part. The coolest part is if you don't like your current job, your current situation, your current scenario, guess what? You can always make a change. You can always make a shift. If you don't like it, at least you know you got to work in the right industry. You work in the right, you have the right people around you. You have systems and process you can follow. You have a model of success to duplicate. My friends here in the United States of America, if you are watching this, you are in the right country. You're in the right land of the free, of the home, of the brave. It's now up for you to get it done. That being said, guys, let me know your thoughts, your comments, your questions, your feedback. Put it in the comment section below. Before I let you go, watch these two videos right here. How I turned $500 and built a $45 million company. In this video right here, how one mindset made me $1.8 million in a year. So if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. That being said, from Dallas, Texas, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to smart, continue to smart, and be money smart today.